Good afternoon. How do you feel today? How did you feel yesterday? Have you ever had a day where you were so sick that you could not get out of bed? Fortunately, for most of us, when we do get so sick, we soon recover and get back to our lives as usual. However, some never recover. Their health spirals downward until they can no longer fight infection. This is catastrophic. How does this happen? Why does this happen? And most importantly, can it be prevented? Mankind is at war with bacteria. We have been, since we first joined the planet, occupied by bacteria. The war started long ago, and we slowly evolved to the dominant life form on Earth. However, now we need to be tremendously concerned about the daily battles that we fight with bacteria more than ever. Specifically, in the environment in which we are most vulnerable, hospitals. More importantly, operating rooms. We'll come back to this, but for a moment, just keep the thought of how vulnerable we are while we are in an operating room. This single cell organism has a very simple DNA, but just like you and I, has a tremendous will to survive. Like humans that require food and water to survive, bacteria require nutrients and moisture. However, unlike humans, bacteria have the ability to grow as a colony, doubling in size day after day after day. These silent enemies are having a major impact in our world. Now for the tricky part. We need these silent enemies to survive. If bacteria and humans went Facebook official, the relationship status would read, it's complicated. <laughs> Not all bacteria are dangerous but it's the few villains that we need to focus on. And they are gaining in strength each and every day. Ever since we arrived, bacteria have tried to eliminate us. In the words of Colonel Sam Daniels, played by Dustin Hoffman in the movie Outbreak, you have to admire its simplicity. It is one billionth our size, and it is beating us. These words have never been truer than they are today. So let's go back in history, and let's visit information about this species that occupies the surfaces in the air that surrounds us. It's 1920. Warren Harding has recently been elected president. World War I ended just a year ago. All women west of the Mississippi River have been granted the right to vote. And the invention of the bulldozer is on the horizon. It's a little too early for us to tell whether or not bacteria are winning the war, but they certainly are putting up a fight. 
The life expectancy of a man is 54. That of a woman, 55. The leading causes of death are tuberculosis, pneumonia, and gastrointestinal infections following close behind. Based on these statistics, it certainly would seem that the bacteria are winning significant battles. So let's look at them as military. The bacterial army, navy, and air force are charging on. The army operate through traditional tactics from across the battlefield, utilizing themselves as a weapon. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Navy, they infiltrate our water systems, blindsiding us and crippling us. But most concerningly, and most recently, it's the airborne bacteria, the Air Force, that we have to deal with. These small pathogens travel on dust particles, on water droplets. They are transferred by coughing, sneezing, laughing, talking, and simply breathing from person to person. Where are they all coming from? Predominantly, they're coming from us. Airborne bacteria introduced in environments is mainly from our skin. We each release around 70,000 skin cells per minute. Let me restate that so that it sinks in. We each release 70,000 skin cells per minute, of which approximately 10% are biologically active. This equates to approximately 10 pounds of skin per year. That's some kind of diet, huh? <laughs> so we all know someone who's entered an operating room procedure that was performed successfully and perfectly by the surgical team, but they returned home with an infection. For me, this person was my grandmother, where many years ago I was first introduced to a hospital-acquired infection. The effect is a lot more meaningful when it's not just a statistic and it's someone that you love. So now picture this. In an operating room where there are hundreds of thousands of particles traveling through the environment. Imagine one particle with one bacteria cell landing on the surgical member's glove or an instrument or an implant that is then placed inside the patient's body. This bacterium will now begin to fight to survive. It will seek out nutrients and moisture, and it will begin the growth of a colony. Day after day, week after week, month after month, possibly year over year, undetected by you or the patient. The amazing part is during this process, the bacteria actually communicate with one another. They talk, and they share one piece of information. They share how many of them there are, and they are waiting until they get to the defined integer that is their signal to synchronize an attack, release their toxins, and make a run on the hill in the war for their survival. There are many ways to approach infection control. As a data junkie, I measure everything. If you cannot measure it, you cannot control it. And you cannot win the battles 
nor the war. In the case of hospital operating room infections, I recommend that we measure everything. Organize the data and solve the problem. And this is what scientists are working on at Drexel University. They're not only studying the origin of bacteria, the types of bacteria, but most importantly, its means of transportation in the operating room. Let's take a different perspective and think about the other ways in order to fight infection. Historically, we have simply accepted the fact that bacteria are everywhere. They're in the environment, they will enter our bodies, so therefore, we can subsequently kill them with antibiotics. However, the bacterial army is getting wise to our tactics. They're improvising, they're adapting, they're changing, and antibiotics are no longer as effective as they once were. So let's take a different approach. What is the best way to never lose a fight? Don't get in the fight, and you've never lost a fight. So with airborne bacteria in the operating room, let's just keep the bacteria out of the surgical site, and we can't lose. Sounds reasonable enough? This is not the first time that this solution has been identified. In fact, it was identified over 40 years ago. The father of arthroplasty, Sir John Charnley, identified that the airborne bacteria were causing infections in the operating room. The solution then and the solution today is a stringent ventilation system that requires the air in an operating room to be changed 500 times an hour. The result of this is an environment with less than five colony forming units. This is a federal law in the United Kingdom. It is required. Meanwhile, in the United States, our codes and standards are subpar. We require only 20 air changes per hour. And there are no requirements for colony forming units in the operating room. The result is ORs in the United States can have up to 400 colony forming units per cubic meter of air. Would you want that bacterial air force flying over you or a loved one in the operating room? Back to the operating rooms in the U.S. and the problem. It's put us in a situation where we need to measure and control something we cannot see, hear, smell, or feel. Is it really there? Does it really exist? Is it really causing infection? How can we control what we cannot sense? As particles travel through the environment, the hundreds of thousands of particles, it's almost seemingly incomprehensible to how we can trace one from its source to a destination, whether that destination is a surgical site or it's in a filtration system that has captured it to protect the patient. It's almost impossible. That is until now. And this is exactly what scientists are focused on to try and identify. Through the use of computational fluid dynamics, we can now measure not only the source of the bacteria, but the trace of its path through its network and its meaningful ways that it gets to either a place of security from the surgical site or the surgical site itself. In addition to measuring the airflow, the volume, 
and the particle count, the technology now exists to measure the real-time bacteria in an operating room, to quantify, qualify, and geolocate its source. Through the use of advanced microprocessor technology and graphene surface sensors, we can now react and prevent an airborne attack at a surgical site. Let's go back to Sir John Charnley for a moment. If he recognized that the air was the problem, then why is it not the global standard? Well, as Americans, we are fighters. And perhaps we chose the path to fight the bacteria through the use of antibiotics, not realizing that there was an alternative means to win the battle. Thankfully, there have been numerous U.S. institutions that are realizing this. With the 40,000 operating rooms in the United States, there are currently 400 ultra-clean ventilation systems installed. I believe we have reached the tipping point. And we are going to be in a position where advanced technology can protect the patients as we spread this knowledge across the country. More and more design professionals are becoming aware. And this all starts with you. So in a parting thought, I would like to ask you to think about the air in an operating room prior to you or a loved one going in for a procedure. Be vigilant. Ask the question of the surgical team or the hospital staff if the environment for which you will be placed has ultra clean air. In most situations, individuals in the healthcare community are not even aware of the technology that's in their ORs. This is the only way to ensure that you are protected and that the air is properly circulated and filtered to eliminate the millions of particles in the OR and the life-threatening bacteria from entering your body and winning a battle in the war with bacteria. Or should I say as a pacifist, avoiding the war. Air matters. <laughs>